everyone, my name is Alex. I work for Red Hat and has been for the last many, many, many years doing mostly GNOME stuff, but like the last three or four years I've been doing mostly work on Flatpak and related things such as FlatHub and other infrastructure parts. This talk is going to be about maintaining a Flatpak repository. It's something you might want to do if you have your own thing, like if you want to have a CI set up and maintain a repository where you can download it from, or if you're just interested in how it works, because most of the time maybe you want to piggyback on, on some pre existing thing like FlatHub repository. So that's a lot less work, but it's still interesting to know how these things work, and it's something you might want to do. Um, so first of all, what's Flatpak? And I kind of assume that everyone here has like a vague idea how it works. It's all this sandboxing and whatnot. But, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to think that an app is just a bunch of files. And it's actually not far, far from the truth, right? It's just a bunch of files plus some metadata about the app that tells us how to run it. But the metadata is also used to file. So it truly is just a bunch of files. And I'm going to talk about how those files are stored locally and on the server, and how we kind of transfer them between the server and, and, the, and the local installation. And also, how we can set up like a, a, a network architecture that, that efficiently lets you download these things. And then we'll talk some about FlatHub and, and the specific way we choose to set that up. Yeah. But, but like the first half of it is going to be somewhat theoretical and, and, and actually not so much about Flatpak as about OS3 because OS3 is, is the basis for all that is Flatpak, in particular, you know, the network side of it. And, and the, short, the short thing to say about OS3 is that it's like Git for operating systems and for operating systems because initially it was created for storing the entire operating system. We don't actually do that. In Flatpak, we use uses for the apps and the runtimes. Uh, but, but in a similar way, it's still very much like Git. And if you know anything about Git, if you know about the internals of Git, the object model, you're going to recognize a lot of stuff I'm talking about. But if you don't, just ignore this. It's just not really important. We'll tell you every, everything you need to know anyway. The basis for... Uh, how you store stuff is a repository, uh, and, and in, in particular, a local repository. In Git terms, this would be the .git directory, but in OS3, it's usually called repo or something like that. And you have an app here. Now, this is clearly not an app, like a Flatpak app. It's just a bunch of files. But you can recognize it as an app. And it's got regular files in it and regular directories. And to start with, you want to commit this to an OS3 repository. So you start by generating an OS3 repository with the OS3 init command, and then you use the commit operation to, to generate a name in the repository that contains these files. And the name in this case is called branch, or the kind of thing, the kind of names that are the branch. And, and in this case, it's called master. It could be called anything. In Git, you were, you we're used to master being the, the, the thing you normally pull, the thing where you do maintenance. That's not strictly true for, for OS2 repos. Normally, you use completely different names, and we'll come later to how uh, Flatpak does it. But, you know, so people recognize it. Let's call it master. An app here is the directory, and it prints this weird string of numbers, which is the object ID for the commit. Actually, all these numbers I'm showing here are, are shortened. In reality, they'll be like 20 characters or something. But now we have this directory committed into repository, and we can use the OS3 show command to show us the commit. It additionally shows us the metadata that we know about it, like the time we committed it, the subject. There's also like you can add more information. It's like this, like it's like a git commit. You can have the summary and a comment and it's got some other things in there too. And this will generate a repository 
and repository is also just a bunch of files. Uh, the, the config uh, file here is basically just says this is an OS3 repository of this particular kind. And then we have an objects directory that contains all the files and a refs directory. And the refs directory, I mean, it's somewhat confusing because sometimes we talk about branches and sometimes it's about refs. But a ref is just a name for something a bit more generic than branch. Like a tag would also be a kind of ref. It's like a generic version of branch. But the, the ref file for master is just a text file that contains the, the object identifier for that particular commit. And all the data is in the objects directory. And you can see here, I colored the files that match from the original commit. So there's a, f uh, there's a this dot file thing, which is yellow, which is the original readme file. And when it is in the repository, you can still like cat it, and it's still a regular file. It contains all the data that was originally in there, and it also has the same uh, permissions, and user ownerships, and all the sorts of things that you think are part of the file inside the repository. But the other files are different. They're basically metadata files about things. So we, we could follow the commit. We cat, or we open the um, the ref file. We see what the commit ID is. So we can so we can open the commit object by use, using its name, and the commit object would have a pointer to the root directory, which is the dir tree thing. And the dir tree is just a list of file names and the corresponding object that they point to, which is either a different dir tree or a, or a dot .file object. So we can like recursively spider everything starting from the ref file. Um, and uh, yeah, that way you can find any, everything. And if you change a branch, which you do by committing a new version of it, so if you change, um, if, we, if we change, oh yeah, Let's just show you. So, but it, but if you change, what did I miss something? Yeah, here it is. So if we change this file, the, the README file, we'll just add some stuff to it, and we commit again, then we will produce a new commit object. And, and the new commit object would look the same as the previous one, uh, except it also has a parent commit. So if we, if we look, if we open the, um, we can see here how it looks. So we have added a bunch of things in the objects directory. So we have the new commit, which points to the new dir tree for, for the root, and the new file for, for the, the file we changed. All the things we didn't change still keep the old objects around. Uh, but we can follow the ref file and find all the, data, all the files that are part of the current commit. But there's also like a parent pointer in the commit object, so we can find the parents and all the commit in that and the parents of that. So you can find like the entire history of the, th of the thing and <clears throat> enumerate uh, how it looked at any point in time. And the reason why we reuse things if they're the same is because the names of the identifier, like these random numbers, aren't actually random. They're like checksums of the content you put in them. Uh, so I think for, for the dirt tree, it's actually like a checksum of the file. But for the regular files, the checksum contain things like UID, GID, permissions, type of file, and the, the things that we consider, if this changed, it should be a different object. So, uh, so th those are also part of the checksum. Uh, but this, this way we, we, we can, right, this time I just modified one file and then commit it again. But a more common thing was, was, would be you have a complete new build like however you built your thing, when it's done, you start from scratch and you build it and you commit the thing. And you don't really know which files changed, but it will automatically detect that 
two files are the same because they have the sh same checksum and we won't even have to commit uh, the new object. We just keep using the old one. And, and, and then we do the reverse operation, which is the checkout. So we have this original uh, repository that we created before, and it w we want to check at it, check it out to a directory called new. And OS3 basically just looks at the latest uh, version of the ref file and recursively uh, lists all the contents in there and creates files based on it. And from an initial point of view, this looks super simple, but if you look into a bit more detail, it's actually a bit more complicated because all the files in there have this link count of two. They're actually hard links back into the object files. So creating a, a checkout is a very cheap operation because of this. Like we have to create new nodes, but none of, none of the data gets copied around. I mean, we don't create new, we don't, we don't copy files basically. We just create new inodes. And uh, th that means both that it's very cheap to generate in terms of time, but it also uh, is, is cheap in terms of, of disk space. We can make however many checkouts we want, and if we check out different versions of things, they will be between themselves sharing things. All the files, if, if I check, check out both of these versions, they will be hard linked both into the, well, they will all be hard linked to each other basically. So we, we save a lot of space and time using, doing this. And also since eventually we will be using these for, from different applications, if it's the same inode, then all the page cache that happens in the kernel will sh be shared. Like if, if two apps are using different runtimes, say, but they happen to share a file, they will be the same inode and therefore they will be sharing the page cache for, for, for uh, M apps of, of the uh, libc library or whatever. So, so it saves on disk, it saves on memory, it saves on uh, time. And the way this, or the reason we can do it this way is because eventually these checkouts will be used in a, um, in a read-only fashion. So it wouldn't be safe if we could modify a file and then also change the, the file in the repository or some other app's file. But since we used these, I mean, in, in the case of Silverblue, the entire operating system is read-only, so you couldn't change the files. And, and, and in, ter in terms of Flatpak, uh, when we create the sandbox, the b bind mounts of these things will be read-only, so it's also safe to, to, uh, to share things, basically. So if we go back to Flatpak, we use this. Um, every installation has an OS3 repository, and an installation actually means more than just the machine. We can have multiple installations on a machine. This is the default system one uh, in Barlib, but there's also a default user one that each user has one, and you can configure your own if you have if you have like a, an ex external disk that you want to have installed apps on. You can drop a config file and get a new system installation place where you can add your, so you can install your files, or your apps there instead. And, and we use these long identifier as branch names for, for representing the uh, apps and the runtimes in the repository. So they got slashes in them, but it actually is just a string, right? It's it's long string, but it's just a string. And then we commit the apps and the runtimes into this repository uh, in an initial operation where we pull it into the repository and then we do something called deploy where we check out uh, the refs next to the repository. In the git, typical use of git, you would have only one checkout of a repository. You would have a git.git .git directory and in the parent directory you would have a check out and if you wanted to check out a different branch, you would normally modify in place the current checkout. But that's not how you would use OS3. You would instead create a new directory on the side with a new version and you wouldn't modify that, the thing you checked out anyway. Like you just want to use it as is. Uh, so 
Uh, and we check it out by, by the identifier of the commit so we can have multiple checkouts and they won't be affecting each other. So if, you, if you take a look in detail in Varlib uh, Flatpak, uh, still this long string which is just a, well, it's actually a couple of directories now because the slashes are suddenly files but uh, in the stable version of gedit, there's an actual checkout by the commit ID and then we have an, uh, an active sim link. And when you, and you install it or when you update, the last thing we do is shift the active sim link to the latest version. So uh, you create a new directory, write to it. When you're done, you would do some kind of F sync or something to ensure that it's really stable. And then we can just do a shift of the uh, sim link to atomically switch to the new version. And the old directory is kept around until the last instance dies. So it, it, it's kind of nice because if, if you compare it to say an RPM based distribution or deb, your Firefox will die if you update it because its file changed while you were using them. But here we keep the old ones around until the last instance died. Yet at the same time, atomically at the point you switch this link, any new instances will get the new data. And if you look inside the app, it's just like a bunch of regular files and some metadata and whatnot. But if you wanna distribute this thing, storing it this way is not ideal. So OS3 has a different mode for repository it's called archive mode. The previous mode is called bare because like it's, it's just the files as themselves. In archive mode, they're install, instead compressed. So instead of .file, we have .file Z, which are Clib compressed files that actually also have like a tiny header with the uh, UID and permissions and all that because we can't rely on the getting the permissions from a HTTP server. So we have to embed them in the file itself. Uh, and we also have this file called .summary. Generally, we still have this refs file. When you work on such a repository locally, it's nice to have, but it doesn't work remotely. Like you can't expect to enumerate a directory over an HTTP server. It just doesn't work. So we, on the server, we generate this file called summary that lists all the, all the refs and their current values. Uh, additionally, there's two files, one called commit meta, which adds metadata to a commit, and the summer.sig, both which are primarily used as a way to store GPG signatures of the summary and the commit, so you can sort of verify that nothing changed, that you can trust. Like in, in addition to whatever network security you have in HTTPS or whatnot, can, you can trust that whoever initially signed this thing, it's still the same bits. And the signature actually is only of the commit object. But since the commit object contains the checksum of the root directory that contains the checksum of the files, it's like a recursive signature of the entire content. So as long as you verify that each file you download has the right checksum that it's supposed to have, it, like it, its name is its checksum, then you can trust the signature of the entire thing just by the, the checksum of the commit object. So, so the summary file has some extra features. You can use it to avoid the problem that you cannot enumerate things, but it's also a single atomic way to get access to, to uh, the entire contents of the uh, repository. All, all we ever do is add objects to a repository. So, if you have a summary file from a particular point in time, you could use that and you have full access to the entire state of the repository at that time. So if you have something like a dependency, for instance, between an app and its locale extension, you're pretty sure that even if you download the first one and it takes a while and then you download the second one, they are gonna match because we have like an atomic view of the entire thing. And also, the summary file can be sort of large, so we, we always try to work with a local copy of it. 
Additionally, there's some generic space in the OS3 summary file that we use specifically in Flatpak. Uh, we store, for every app in there, we store the metadata about the app in the summary file. So we know ahead of time that this app will require this or that runtime. That way we can download it or fail if it's not available or something. But we can also say things like, in this new update, there's a new permission required for like access to your camera. Do you really want to install it or do you want to stop or not allow that or something like that? And it also has information about things like installed size, download size. The download size is a bit complicated, but it's at least an estimate so we can show things in the UI before we try to download them. Uh, and we have things like end of life info where we can say this is not supported anymore. Maybe you should consider using something else. And there's also a different version where we can say it's not supported. It's got got a new name. You should instead use this thing. That that clients can automatically switch over to the new the new name if someone else took over or for for whatever reason it changed name. So generally, you start when, in an update by using uh, an OS3 pull operation. And, and it's, it's basic what I've been talking about. You download the summary file, you verify that it's okay. <clears throat> you create a directory where we can start downloading things. And then we look at uh, the commit object, you verify the checksum, the checksum is okay. And we start uh, downloading objects as required. Often when you have, when you're doing an update or for whatever else reason, you already have some object available. Maybe it was shared from another app or whatever. You can stop as soon as you hit something. Because we always, we always tend to download in the depth first matter. So if an object like a directory is available, we can assume all the files are there. So we can pretty easily detect when we can just ignore a whole large parts of the app and just pick the ones that have changed. And when we're done, we do, again, we F-sync everything, move it in place, and if the last things we do is, is update the ref file, so we have a local, another kind of atomic update of the commit. We also have something called static deltas in the repositories. That's kind of an optional feature, but it's uh, very useful for performance reason. There's basically a binary diff going from one particular commit to a different commit. Like, it doesn't even have to be of the same branch, but typically it's from the previous commit to the, to the latest commit, or, or for, from like two, two generations ago or whatever, or from the last major release. You can, you can generally pick whatever strategy you want, because all it, ha all it is is a file named by commit A to commit B, and then when you're doing a particular pull operation, you know where you're going from and what you're going to, and you can just concatenate them and see if there's a file called that in the summary file. And they can also be from nothing, like, it's not actually a delta then, but it's more like a single file that can contain the compressed, um, entire thing compressed in a single file. And it has certain advantages in terms of uh, the number of round trips you have to do to download something. So if you, if you have a long, or a large runtime with a many, many small files, like a, you know, all the sim links in a runtime, or all the small files and translations and stuff, they compress a lot better if you put them in a long file and do it as a single uh, HTTP download. Actually, like, I think the summary splits at 16 meg or something, so it's a chunk of files that are 16 uh, megabytes. Uh, and another nice thing about them is that being single files no, means we know ahead of time the entire operation for downloading them. So we can, we can give you a per byte progress reporting. Whereas in the case of, of a regular OS3 pool, it's a very complicated operation to determine ahead of time how much data we need to download because it depends on what we happen to have available already. Like maybe we have some objects because we have the previous version or maybe we randomly for whatever ob reason had objects that 
that, that uh, is going to be in the new one. And we don't even know ahead of time before we started recursing into the new one which things we're going to be pulling. So progress reporting in OS3 is always kind of lame and you know, estimates. We also use something called AppStream to describe applications. I'm sure most people are aware of it, but it's like an XML format that describes human readable details about app your application. The details is not so important, but what is important is that we need a, or need, we want a repository wide version of all the flat, or of all the app stream stuff. So each app has its own app stream data. And we, we have this operation on the server that combines them all into one. Because that way we have a single thing that we can download on the client and have a, a list with all the data and all the icons and whatnot so that an app like GNOME software can work or, or KD Discover or whatever app store like thing you have. Uh, th it's actually, there's actually one of these per branch or per architecture, there's one branch per architecture so you're not downloading things you're never going to use. But it's important whenever you update something you need to update this thing. So you have to be aware of that when you're doing updates. So that was kind of the, uh, the uh, theoretical part of the talk. And now we're going to talk a bit in, in, in like practical sysadmin terms. What does it mean to maintain uh, a repository? Like first of all, you have to have a machine where you store like the canonical representation of all the stuff that's in the repository. And you typically have an, a, a machine where you have a repository in archive mode. It doesn't necessarily have to be an HTTP server, but that's one way to set it up. So you manage the repo on the web server. Alternatively, you can have a master machine and then like R sync it to a machine that it's uh, network facing, or you can use some other kind of sync. At some point, I had this S3 sync thing where you sync to a, an S3 store, an uh, object store. But generally, you just copy, uh, either you directly expose or you copy the repo somewhere. In the case where you're doing syncing to a different thing, you have to be really careful about the summary file. You can always upload new objects unless you change the summary file, nothing is ever gonna to, going to um, access them, right? If nothing refers to them, it's safe to add them there. But once you change, the, m once you update the summary file, all the object it references are better be in the repository already. So you have to have this two-phase thing where you sync first, first of the objects, and then you sync the summary files. And you have to be really careful to avoid mismatches between the summary and its signature, because if you download a different version of those, the signature will not be correct, and it's, and your client is going to complain. Right? Typically, those are small files, so you can, if you use, copy them at the same time and move them in place as an atomic operation, it's not gonna happen. And, and even if it does, it's, uh, it might be hitting one client, and the next time they try, it, it's gonna be resolved. But you have to be really careful about caching on this thing, because if you accidentally cache different version of the signature and the summary file, then you're gonna cause this mismatch to stand, like, be forever and your, all your clients are going to complain. And also, don't typically build on this server. I mean, if you were just doing this on your laptop or whatever, like you could do it, but in general, don't. I mean, first of all, it's just not possible. You might be building for any number of architectures and your server is only going to have one, but also you don't want to load your server with building random stuff. Instead, what you do is you build each architecture on some other machine and then you move all the builds on, on the master repository and then you import them. And typically what you, you do when you pull something into repository is use OS3 pull, but that's not quite what we want in this particular case. We, the new commit will not have the correct history of things like the previous 
commit and whatnot, probably won't have any parent at all and even if it has one, it's not necessarily one that, that will be the previous one in the, in the master repository. So we have this other uh, commit from operation that basically you reconstruct a new commit object based on a previous one but changing some things including the, the parent. Because it's really important to get the parent thing right because then you can get the deltas working correctly for instance. Uh, also, this, you have to specify the GPG key and whatnot to make it sign stuff. And I would recommend this timestamp equal now because then you get, uh, if, if you have multiple builds for instance, uh, you synchronize the timestamp of all of them by setting the timestamp to the time of when you import something. And also like it's just nice to have the timestamp be when it was publicly available. And then typically you want to specify don't update the summary when you import it because you might be importing multiple things and then at the end you run this update repo thing and that will update the summary so you don't want to have unnecessary churn of this file. Uh, and anyway the final thing will also update the app stream branches and you can use it to generate deltas if you want and you can use the prune operation to remove old versions of, uh, of your app. I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that because it's very nice to be able to bisect builds. But for something like a, a nightly build, you don't really want, you know, infinite amount of builds. It's just not going to work. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're using GPG for this. It's not the greatest thing in the world, it's kind of painful to work with, but it's what we have. So you have to be very careful about how you use GPG. Don't use your own key first. I'm, it's very easy to have this key which is your private key and you just use it for everything. But it's a very bad idea if you ever want someone else to maintain the thing or if you need to rotate your key and so basically what you want to do is create a new GPG key every time you start a new repository. And that key should only be available on the master server. Even better on some p piece of hardware. We have a USB dongle on the, on the FlatHub servers so that the private key is never ever visible on any machine. Like we can still sign using it because it's unlocked on that particular machine but nobody can log in and make a copy of it and then sign things on their own. And the other thing to be careful about is Whenever you do an operation that updates the summary or creates a new commit, you have to make sure you specify your GPG key. Otherwise, you're producing an unsigned commit or an unsigned summary, and, and not you, you get complaint from people who can't download stuff. We do support uh, key rotation. It's not perfect. You can create a new key add it to your uh, repo and whenever people update they will get the new key in addition to the previous one. So you, you keep signing with the old thing but you will see the new key to every user and then at some point you just have to decide you want to switch over and whoever hasn't run updates since you added it will suddenly not get, um, have the latest key. So it's, it's not perfect in the sense that you have to update at some specific cre frequency for it to work. But if you m wait for a month or something, probably it's okay, right? Um, previously, I was talking about just having a server being HTTP. In practice, for a large thing, you probably want some kind of mirroring. The traditional mirroring of open source is like some university r syncs nightly or a list of files and you have a list of repositories and you try them one at a time and maybe it was synchronized at that point and it works or maybe it didn't then you go to the next one and try. It doesn't quite work for, for O Street. It has to be like, it has to work. You can't have like partial things and it's just so many files it's much harder to synchronize. But instead, the more modern way is to use the CDN, which is just called a content distribution network, which is basically a kind of proxy. So we have like download 
cloudhub.org is actually pointing to a pool of IPs where it picks the closest one to you geography, uh, like the closest geographically to you, and then it will, that will have a cache of the, the upstream thing, and if it doesn't, it will download it and cache it for the next time. So you get much better uh, network bandwidth for a local thing, but also shorter ping times and just general like, better performance. And OS3, the way it's structured, makes it very nice for CDNs. Like all the files in the Office directory are 100% immutable, so we can just cache those forever and let you know let the CDN figure out when they want to invalidate them. But there's there's no limit in how long we can ca keep them around. And you, the only thing you have to be worried about is, is the summary file because that thing will update every time you import a new thing a few new things whenever you update the repo basically. So alternatives there are to have low caching on those or uh, if, if your CDN allows it you can like manually flush them at the time when you up do a repo update. And in the case of Flatpak, uh, Flathub we use this Fastly which is a CDN that works really nice for us most of the time and we have some issues with service in China being slow and whatnot, but most of the time it, w it works really fast and they are shipping a lot of data for us for free which is really nice. We get like 99% hit radio because everything is, is immutable and we have a, there's a simple REST API you can use to flush the summary file that we just hit all the nodes uh, and we do that like only when we update the, uh, uh, when, when it's actually updated we can just invalidate it which is great because uh, then we can also cache that everywhere. But doing man these kind of manual maintenance of repository can get kind of painful. So I wrote a tool called Flat Manager. It's a, it's a, REST, a, a REST service that maintains the repository for you. It's this Rust thing that uses Postgres. It's all modern and stuff. A lot of fun writing that. Uh, it uses uh, web tokens, so you can like hand out different levels of authentication to people. For instance, you can allow people to upgrade, uh, to upload to only to one repository, or only to a particular application ID, or even like only to a particular build. So it's very flexible in that way. So we can, from FlatHub, for instance, hand out. Uh, tokens that let the free desktop people update their summary without us having to do anything. But they can't like modify any other files. Uh, and you configure it to maintain one or more repository on disk. Plus there's a separate list of dynamically created test repositories that it maintains. So the way it works it is you create this new test repository, you seed all the files to it like Typically you do multiple builds, so each build gets updated to this thing, and when uh, everything is there, you commit the test repository, which turns it into a read-only thing with a correct summary file and everything, so you can use it as a test of your app, and if you decide that your build is, is okay, you can publish it to the, uh, to the, uh, like the read repository. Or you can just use it for CI. We use the same thing for CI, but we never actually publish the resultant C, uh, <coughs> test repository. We just keep it around and let you test your build, and eventually it will like auto delete old stuff. That's very useful. Uh, and also, whenever we do a publish, we handle the entire uh, repository update operation. So the generation of summary files, upstream data. Delta files, all that thing is automatically handled, and we try to chunk it. So if, like, if you have multiple builds going on, we kind of wait for a bit so we can collect as much as possible before we update the thing to avoid churning the summary files. And we also generate some extra data. We can generate flatback ref files for all the apps. We can extract screenshots from the app data. Uh, which is useful for uh, web, uh, the web UI, for instance. And we have shell outs, so you can shell out uh, at publish time, 
which is where you, where you can hook up the uh, CDN invalidation or whatever other kinds of you know, infrastructure automation you want. So it's a Rust binary, it's so very easy to deploy. Uh, you just basically copy it somewhere and run it. Uh, and if you want to use it, you can use the REST API or you can use this client. There's a Python client it ships with where, where you can easily just in a couple of uh, commands, push or build. There's a simple example. At, po at some point, the, the maintainer of, of the uh, repository will give you a token you can use. So you set that as an environment variable. I think you, you can also pass it in various other ways, but for the demo, it's easiest to use a, a, an environment variable. Then you use the create operation, which will give you a different URI, which is URI for your particular build. And then uh, you use the push command to push an entire repo, or you can push a subset of it, like a single build. And you typically run that multiple times on each individual build machine. And then uh, when all the build machines succeed, or if they do, you run the commit operation and then eventually the commit operation, or the publish operation. If, if any of the builds failed or if you weren't actually interested in, in publish it, mm, it um, at all, you can just at the end purge it and it will just delete the temporary test uh, repository. Uh, well, and the wait things just means that we, not only do we uh, queue the operation, we also like show you the log and wait until it's successfully terminated. And there's a simple config format for, for defining configuration of the flat manager itself. So you just uh, add, add a JSON file that specifies minor details like the port, how to find the database, where are my um, GPG keys, what's this, this, you shouldn't use this particular secret. You use generate random thing, which is the basis for the tokens. Basically, you, it's the thing that you sign the tokens with. And the, the build repo base is where we're creating these test repositories and they will all be signed by this key, and then you have a list of, of individual repositories that you want to uh, maintain, where you list where, where to store the repository, what URL will eventually be available at, and, and some other things like sh scripts to shell out, and actually like a more detailed way to specify what kind of uh, deltas we want to generate. Uh, so in this case, like the, the flat top case is even more complicated, but in this case we want to have generally one level of deltas, but two levels for x86, and then no deltas for debug info. It's just, it's just an example. But it's interesting, you might not have that many ARM users, so maybe you don't want to have, use a lot of disk space for deltas for ARM users, but you have a lot of x86 users, you might want to have more of those. Yeah. And then in, in the entire setup and flat hub is that we have the master repository is a physical machine that's hosted at a company called Medic Beast in, in U the UK. And it runs flat manager and it maintains two repositories, one for stable releases and one for beta releases. You never have a bunch of machines that generate deltas Binary diffs are actually kind of expensive to compute, so you don't want to do that on the master machine. Instead, we have a kind of worker set up where workers ask the, the master uh, flat manager for, for jobs, and it will tell it to generate the delta between this and that, and it will download them and, and do, uh, generate uh, a delta and upload it. And we have a billbot master Billbot is really kind of a CI system, so it's not a super great fit for us, but we have like a bastardized version of it where we made it do our bidding basically. It's still not ideal, but it's got a working setup where the master machine uh, shells out, or it calls out, it allocates workers, and the workers connect to it and uh, ask for jobs, and so Anytime you want to build something, it picks one, like one ARM machine, one Intel machine, one ARM64, one Intel64, and then it 
gives them a token. So the workers have tokens to upload the results, but it's like limited tokens that can only upload to that particular build because the build, we create the build on the master side and then we only let each individual worker upload to that build. And then it synchronizes everything and that collects logs and has a web UI that you can show the logs and see what's happening. Eventually they all succeed or one of them fails. And then we either commit uh, the build or just delete it and say it failed. Uh, and then we have front end machines that are basically just Nginx mirrors of, or proxies for, for the fabric manager but you know offloads a bit by, you, you, by having a disk cache and, and that's where all the CDN talks to so like the shyness nodes will download from the front which in turn uh, downloads from flat manager itself. And we also have a web app that basically just scrapes the, the repo and generates web pages for all the apps with all the app data in it. All the sources for the manifest, the, the things that go into build are GitHub, one GitHub repo per app in, in this FlatHub uh, organization. And we set up GitHub to send change notification to the buildbot master and the buildbot master picks up like if you modify the master uh, repository it will automatically trigger a build but also if you create a new PR it will uh, generate like a, a test build that is not meant to be published but when it, if it succeeds it will give you a link to the test repository and if it doesn't succeed it would point you to the logs that where it failed. Yeah and then the, you know the, the master will pick this up and trigger builds and whatnot. When a build succeeds we will put it on a queue to eventually publish that way we can sort of um, collect multiple uh, commits to the same time or multiple publish to the same time so we avoid churn. But if you really want to you can also manually publish your thing or if you tested it and it turns out that even if it built it doesn't work we can delete the thing before it gets out of published. Uh, we have x86 and ARM builders donated by CNCF and CodeThink. These, especially the CNCF machines are like huge ass. Like the ARM bit, ARM1 is the six, ARM64, 64, 64 CPU monster. Uh, but they also built for 32 bits, so they, they got a lot of work out. Uh, yeah, they have limited tokens, so they, don't, they are very limited in what they can do, but they're really powerful. And the web app basically just downloads the app stream regularly and inserts it into a Postgres, Postgres database and then there's like, there's this a Java backend that looks into the database, exposes some kind of uh, JSON API and the front end is an Angular thing that just shows you the data from it. Various things in the UI are just links to stuff that the flat manager generates so you can, you can tell flat manager to extract for instance the screenshots into a specific directory and then we can just generate links to that. And also it, it links to Flatback Ref for one click installs. Those can also be generated automatically by Flat Manager. I think I only had a couple of minutes left so I have some time for questions. Questions? I was super clear. Oh, there's one. Um, one of the things that I found difficult uh, as a uh, sometimes contributor to different bits in Flatpak is is finding which uh, where which repository contains the code that's responsible for one particular one particular thing. For example, uh, when using FlatHub, one of the uh, one of the problems that we encountered was invalid app stream files, stuff like that. It was really difficult to try and find the 
which bit was responsible for like passing data out of the software that we'd maintain to try and find where a problem might be. Like for example, the screenshots that appeared duplicated and you know, very, very small bugs. Something that we'd like to spend time actually fixing and but I couldn't easily contribute because I didn't know which part of the the whole ecosystem was responsible for it. You, you mean, do you mean where you where to find the thing where that was packaged or the thing that was verifying? So, uh, the thing that was verifying, yeah. uh, how it was called, yeah, whether I mean, it was in Flat Manager, whether it was, you know, glue. All of that is done it. in like bad hacks in, in the uh, build bots or build bot config. And yes, that is not very well documented. And I guess we should do better about that. It, it, it part, Partly it was because we added a bunch of, like, we increased the requirements in terms of upstream validation. So a lot of things that used to build doesn't anymore. And the error, error, error message you get are not the nicest thing ever. Yeah. Well, there, there was that and there were some other changes that were made that, that broke things in subtle ways that yeah. people couldn't really find. It do. So it was it was pretty difficult. I I think that if it were documented, it would make it so much easier to contribute to. Yeah, I would. We'll look into that. Um, is there any system for removing a revision of a particular app from this from the system, or is the repository just going uh, all the time? So so, I mean, do you mean like? We don't want to have it at all. I'm just thinking, or, I mean, one, one option is just uh, retiring uh, revisions which are really, really old. Yeah, so, so, we have, so, so we have a, first of all, I think we do like purge revisions eventually. Like there, there's some max depth of the number of commits you can have for each in the I don't, I don't remember the details of how, how far back it goes now. But, but if you just want to delete an app completely, we don't really do that. Instead, we mark it as end of life. So, and, that, and that means it's, if something is marked end of life, it, it will not typically be listed when you, when you use the client. But if you happen to have it installed already, it still like, doesn't completely break. I guess the other case is like if you accidentally publish nuclear launch codes or something in your application and you want to make sure this revision disappears. And yeah, I mean, it, we don't have anything for, for automation on that, but I mean, okay. if you ask some admin, we can do, you know, manual work on that. But there's no automatic handling of that. Okay. And it's so actually it's somewhat complicated. You have to like, I mean, if you just delete it completely, it's fine. But if you want to rewrite history, it's complicated. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on like adding testing eventually to this this like pipeline. So before the apps actually get into flat like automatic CI before publishing. Yeah. I mean, it, that would be awesome. Uh, just see if anyone's yeah. thought about it or any tests. I haven't thought about it at all, actually. Uh, the idea right now is that you can, once it's built, it it can. Uh, you can you, you can get a copy of it and try it locally, but having some kind of automation of testing is. I mean, if you if you could maybe split out the testing into some sub package and may ensure that that thing runs before we do the publish, that would be interesting. Yeah, sounds cool. Yeah. I mean, it, it's always complicated to test UI yeah. stuff. <laughs> it really is because yeah. like you need an X server and you know, yeah. pull audio and something to verify that you know. It looks all right, and it like handles interaction and, and pr produces sound. I mean, it's complicated to yeah. test, but yeah. certainly some basic stuff we should be able to verify. Cheers.
So any other questions? So if not, I'll leave it to this all. Thanks.